define? Is it gospel music? Is it, is it this? Is it that? What would we define what that really means? And that song that we sang this morning, Jesus, he died for us. Jesus, he rose again on the third day. That's the gospel. Turn with me to uh, Mark chapter 8 in your Bible. Mark chapter 8. We're going to start with verse 31. Shall we stand for the reading of God's word? Mark chapter 8. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. When he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Shall we pray? Father, to bless your words, our hearts may penetrate us and make us your disciples and do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So I'm talking to you about the subject this morning. What is the gospel? We're in the second Sunday of Lent, the season of Lent, which leads up to the death and resurrection of Jesus, the season of Easter. And so we want to tackle the subject, what is the gospel? It's mentioned here in the text. And in short, the gospel is the good news. Everybody say, good news. Good news. If we have so much bad news today, it's time to get some good news. You know, if you win the lottery, someone say, ooh, that's good news. If you get a sale at a store and you're trying to get a good buy, someone say, that's good news. If you get a new CD and you release it and it goes platinum, that's good news. Well, the good news is the glad tidings of the coming of Jesus as Messiah and his salvation. Christ, the King of Israel, the Savior of the world. The gospel is the most important and significant message that you can give to anyone. It's a message that you should share with everyone you know and me. Now, what exactly is the gospel? Jesus Christ died for you because of your sin and your wrong deeds, and he rose again on the third day. That is the gospel. He rose with power and brings life to all who believe in him. Notice it says in Mark 31, then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 5. Why would Jesus, why would Jesus die on the cross for your sin and mine? Why would Jesus go through such an excruciating and painful death? Well, Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 kind of gives us a clue about why Jesus... Oh, I'm sorry. Now we're in Romans. So our initial text was Mark chapter 8, but now we're in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone 
might possibly dare to die. But God, is a beautiful verse, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died Amen. for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, and the word justified means to absolve, acquit, or clear from any charge. When you're justified, you're clear. It also means to declare righteous by God. Your sin, you declared righteous when you say yes to him because of the death of Jesus Christ on the, on the cross and the shedding of his blood. That means that you are justified, that you are clear. <coughs> Nothing you and I did, but because of what Christ did. So verse 9, since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. So why did God, why did Jesus do it? I don't know, but he did it. And he did it because of your sin, so that we would be in a right relationship with God. Everybody say, right relationship? Right relationship. And that's who we are as Christians, as born again saints of God. As people here this morning, we are in Christ. And in Christ, we are saved. Now here's a penetrating statement. You might want to write this down. You must respond to the gospel. You must respond. We have to get everybody on the planet in a place where they respond to the gospel. Amen. You might want to write this down. You must fully embrace the gospel. You must fully embrace the gospel. The word embrace means receive. Receive is true into every part of your life. Receive his truth into every part of your life. Now here's another statement that's very, very important. This applies to all of Christianity. This applies to people who say they know God. This applies to people who say they are born again. And this is what we've done, many of us, in America. And we can't do it anymore. We cannot make the gospel aligned with our agendas, but we must conform and surrender to the demands of the gospel. Amen. Ooh, that's a David. What are you talking about? Let's keep reading in Mark chapter 8. Verse 32. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So Jesus is telling them, fellas, I got to die. Fellas, I got to go to the cross. Fellas, I got to give my life. And Peter pulls Jesus aside and says, no master, no master. You can't do that. You can't do that. But when he, Jesus, verse 33, turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. And he said, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God but merely human concerns. So notice the language here in the text. Peter is so in love with Jesus. He seemingly does what he does and says what he says for the right reasons. So what is he doing? He pulls Jesus aside from the disciples and he kind of quietly says to Jesus, you're not in the You can't die on the cross. Jesus, I don't want to lose you. Jesus, I don't want to see you go away. Because Jesus, you've been doing miracles. You've been doing great things. You've been healing people. You healed my mind. You healed my heart. I've given up everything. I gave up my fishing business for you, Jesus. So he was coming at a human perspective. And Jesus then turns, the scripture says, and turns back to the rest of the disciples and the whole crowd that was here, young people. And he says, get thee behind me, Satan. What he was saying? Wow. What a harsh word to give his number one follower. Peter is known that in the church of Christianity, in the church of all time, Peter is uh, Jesus' right-hand man. He's held in highest esteem throughout Christianity. Peter, the right-hand man of God. And Jesus comes. 
calls him Satan. Mm. And then what does he say? You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Here's the rub right now. In Christianity, we have made Jesus conform to our folk ways and mores. That's a sociological term that simply means we made Jesus do what we want him to do. We made Jesus American. And other countries of the world have made Jesus in their cultural and national context. And instead of saying, wait a minute, what is Jesus telling me to do about loving my neighbor? What is Jesus telling me to do about how to treat my wife? What is Jesus telling me about how to treat my parents? What is Jesus telling me to do about how to treat my kids? What is Jesus telling me, kids, about how to treat my parents? Even when all those folk don't do the right thing. Does he say to kick him out? Does he say to move him out of your house? Does he say to divorce them down to step up to him? Does he say to cuss him out? Does he say to shoot him and kill him? That's what they do nowadays. They shoot and kill each other. But Jesus says, love your enemies. Jesus says, love those who persecute you. And we take it in our context and say, we have the right to make them stand up. We have a right to defend ourselves. But Jesus says to love your enemy. Amen. To lay down your gun. Jesus had a disciple, same guy, Peter, when the soldiers came to take him, Jesus was ready. Peter was ready to pull up arms and defend his master and whip out a sword and cut off the man. He was trying to cut off his head. And he missed the head and got the ear. Peter wasn't joking around. You ain't taking my master. Who do you think you are? And Jesus says, no, nah, man, put the sword down. We're not doing the sword thing right now. I got to go to the cross. He still didn't get it because here he's rebuked by Jesus once. And then he didn't get it. And then when the soldiers came later on, he still didn't get it and wanted to resort to human ethics instead of allowing himself to conform to the gospel rather than he conforming to what Jesus is saying. So it says you must deny yourself and take the cross. What does that mean? All of us have this human tendency where we want things our way. All of us have this thing going on in the inside of us. When somebody's coming at us or somebody's saying something to us or somebody doesn't treat us the right way, the natural inclination is to give them back what they did. Fire, fire, and fire. And Jesus has this weird way of touching the human heart and saying, no, oh, give them what they deserve. Or give them what I tell you to give them. That's love. Let the church say amen. amen. And it's hard to love somebody who's being unlovable. It's hard to love somebody who's rubbing you the wrong way. It's hard to love somebody who just got on your last nerve. Oh, yes, it is. It's true. We all know that because we all have been there. Let the church say amen. 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 It's hard. Oh, it's easy to love somebody when they're nice. It's easy to love somebody. Trish and I went to a wedding yesterday, and the people were so in love. They, in fact, it was such a beautiful thing that uh, the preacher led them in the initial part of the vows, and they were just kind of all tensed up and a little nervous. And the one guy, he even said his vow wrong, and the preacher had to repeat it so he could get it right. But all of a sudden, they played a song in the middle of the wedding, and they played this love song. And when they played this love song, they just started swooning back and forth. And they just started looking at each other with their little Google eyes. And they just started falling in love right there in front of all of us. And Trish and I were right in the front row. We saw this love thing going on because the song just got them right in the mood and it got the nerves down. And he was able, after the song was over, to finish saying his vows. And they got married and they were so happy. Matter of fact, they were so happy after the wedding was over and they had the reception and we had eaten food. I was sitting next to him at the couch in the living room area because his wedding was in the house and uh, the photographer was taking pictures and they were just kissing each other and, and taking another picture, kissing each other and taking another picture from another angle, kissing each other and they just couldn't 
easy to love somebody when somebody is loving you. But it's hard to love somebody when they're not loving you. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. That if we want to embrace this gospel of Jesus Christ, we have to throw out. Everybody say, throw out. Throw out. Our own agendas, our own cultural moral ways, our own cultural upbringing, and say, I'm going to follow Jesus and love them regardless. Let the church say amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Whoever wants to be my disciple, the scripture says, they must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. The cross represents suffering. Sometimes we have to suffer to identify ourselves with the things of God in Christ. Sometimes we have to suffer when we say we are Jesus' follower. Sometimes we have to suffer for doing the right thing. Everybody else has a job. Everybody else has school. Everybody else at the party is doing X, Y, and Z. Why can't I? And when you don't do X, Y, and Z at the party at the job, you stand out like a sore thumb. Because they took me out after the uh, after the promotion. They said, David, we want to take you out and celebrate your big promotion. And we had about 25, 30 people that came out. And everybody was all, all you know, offering, I mean, ordering up the hottest and hardest drinks, Harvey Royal Bankers and whiskeys and everything. And, and it came right around me. And he had said to me, as I'm walking in the restaurant, I'm going to get you drunk tonight. Because he knew I pretty much wasn't a drinker. And it came to me, and you know, sometimes I get a glass of sherry, you know, the men of the cabin, but most of the time I don't drink. And I thought to myself, well, it's okay. I'll just do it because my boss is doing it. He just gave me a promotion. And when it came around, I had to say, I have a go. <laughs> my boss looked at me like, I just gave you this promotion, bro. You better do what I want you to do. I said, I have a go. And you know what? He was mad at first. Art and I used to work, Art and Nancy and I all used to work for the same company, the three of us. So we know how the parties and the work happened, and that was a thing in our company. They loved a Friday night to go down and get some liquor in them and get happy. But you know, they had their liquor in them and they was getting happy, but I had my coke in me and I was just as happy. I was laughing and joking and having a good time. And by the end of the evening, my boss looked at me and said, you're all right, man, we had a good time, you had a good time. It was okay, man. But when you take a stand for Jesus, no matter what, you're going to come out on top. Let the church say amen. You've got to deny yourself. You've got to take up your cross. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. What does that mean? Whoever wants to save their life. Are you saving yourself? Are you saving yourself, keeping yourself? Are you keeping yourself that special person in your life? Are you keeping yourself in your job and they get all your attention and all your time? Are you saving yourself for your children? Here's one for your children. Your whole world revolves around your children. Nothing comes before your child. You give them all your time. You give them all your money and you're broke. Are you saving yourself for your reputation? What people will think of you if you don't do what the crowd wants you to do? Are you saving yourself for the wrong things? Are you saving yourself from your destiny instead of saving yourself and reserving yourself for God so he can work through you? I think we all want to be there. Let the church say amen. amen. It says whoever would save them will lose it. What does that mean, losing? That means you're going to be eternally separated from God, that you did not respond to the gospel, the message of Christ, and his death on the cross for you, and you did not embrace him into your life and say, yes, I'm willing to live for Jesus. Yes, I'm willing to be a witness for him. Yes, I'm willing to love people, even when they come at me the wrong way. And you miss your chance to be with God the Son Jesus in heaven for all eternity. But whoever loses their life for me, what does that mean? But if you get to the place where you deny yourself and you're willing to count everything in your life as a loss for the cause of Christ, for the cause of Christ. 
that it doesn't matter if your reputation is honored for Christ. It doesn't matter if people talk about you for doing the wrong thing. It doesn't matter if at work when people ask you to do something that you know is wrong and you don't want to compromise your standards and you want to give excellent customer service and you're not going to compromise because you're going to do the right thing that you promised that you would do something and you stand by your word that you don't find a way to wiggle out of your contracts. Those of you who've been in business for you know what I'm saying? You can take the shortcut or you can do the right thing. Or those of you that own your own business and you have promised your customer that you would deliver a service and just because that customer doesn't treat you right, you find a way to circumvent and do an end around when you know you should be doing the right thing. If you're willing to lose yourself for the gospel's sake, well, what good is it to someone gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? You know, there's a story in the Bible about Dives and Lazarus. And one was rich and one was poor. And the poor person sat at the bed, so the poor person was at the table of the rich person and at the gate of the rich person begging for food and begged all of his life. And the rich person overlooked it. And the story goes on to say, this was a true story, by the way, not a parable. The story goes on to say that both men died. And one went to heaven. And one went to hell. The rich man went to hell. And the poor man went to heaven. Now in the story, it's not saying that rich people are going to go to hell. And this point in the story is that poor people are going to heaven. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that the person that has resources, the rich person, that could have helped this poor person and neglected to have love in his heart and share some of his resources, that's the God of control. And you and I, when we are in a place of saying we're going to say yes to God, that we're willing to realize that saying yes to God and embracing his mandate of the gospel which is to share the love that he has given us with everybody and telling everybody about him that that's more important than you gain the riches of Bill Gates. Or Paul Harden. I know mean, some of you are thinking, well, I wouldn't mind being in this show. This, this shoe for one day, that'd be nice. But the resources that you do have where you are right now, are you willing to share your resources and love somebody as God has called you to love? We can notice what it says. For can anyone give an exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. We've, had, we've been at a place where we've been noticing people who have been in the last stages of their lives. And as I see people going home to be with the Lord, they go to the hospitals, or I see people that are sick, people that are sick. And we've had the occasion recently of seeing some actual young children that we even babies that went home to be with the Lord. And some of you are mourning because of that. Some of you mourn lost spouses. And these are people my mind that are young. And at the very end, that I've been in the presence of people who had terminal sentences and were going to leave, they don't say to me, Pastor, look at my bank account. See how much money I have in my 401k. Pastor, look at my houses. See how much wealth I've acquired. I never have had that happen. Pastor, go in my closet, look at the clothes that I have. Let's see what I've accumulated. Look at my shoes. But all of them say, Pastor, I want to have a great relationship with my Heavenly Father. Would you pray with me so that I have peace with God? And that's the one thing they say. And the second thing they say, Pastor, would you help me so that I can get restored relationships? with my family members that have kind of made a mess. <laughs> See, when it really comes down to it, when we're at that moment and we're ready to leave our last breath, it's not about the things that we
be able to accumulate, and younger people, you guys are getting ready to go to school. And you have the whole world ahead of you, and God wants you to excel in college. And the rest of you that are getting ready to go and obtain your futures, he wants you to excel in your future, and he wants you to do well. And every step of the way, as you take God with you, and as you allow Jesus to be front and center in your life, you're going to find out that you're going to be making more good decisions that are going to help you have a more happy and joy-filled life because you put God first. And this is, this is what you create. This is so exciting about talking to young people right now. You're going to create a life of a legacy of doing good things sowing seed to love other people. And in the process, God's going to bring people in your lives. Some of you will get married eventually, or some of you will be single, whatever you choose. And in your lifetime, you're going to affect people. And people are going to see you blossom like a tree that brings life. And open up to be a beautiful flower, because you are emitting an aroma of love all around you. And you're going to have a legacy of doing good things. And in the meantime, and in the process, he's going to bless you so that you have all your needs met and so that you can help somebody else. There's so many people, when it comes near the end, that they say to me, if I could rewrite time and do it over, but you don't get it to over. So all of you are in your key prime right now. I say all of us, say I'm in my prime. I'm in my prime. And the reason why I say I'm in my prime is the young people and everybody else, we're all in our prime because we all have seven years ahead of us to do the gospel right. Yes. We have seven years ahead of us to let this message of the cross be real. And so that when we come in contact with people, we're not beating them over the head, but we're loving them and doing the right thing. You know, Pastor Victor was here, he had to leave. He's a pastor of another church. He's, in, he's invited this Deborah to come and join him with his prison ministry. And he wants some of us with musical gifts to sing and bring the full band. And he's given us a date, but I'll share with you in the future. And he has 150 people that they minister to right here in town at CRC. That's Columbia River right over by Green Drive. I've been over there several times. And he's invited to the God. And to share with those folks. And the thing that you have to know about Columbia River, because I've done prison ministry there before, they're the ones that are coming out soon. So they've been in the other big house situation serving long sentences. And when they get to Columbia, they're six months or less from coming out. When we go over there and affect them with the gospel of Jesus Christ and love on them, and he's doing it on a continual, weekly basis, and we can help to turn someone's life around when you get to glory one day. The Bible says Jesus is going to say to all of us, when I was sick, did you come visit me? He's going to ask the question. When I was in prison, did you come visit me? Hallelujah. When I was down and out, did you lift me up? And the response in the scripture says, Lord, where do we see you in the sickness? Lord, where do we see you in prison? Kind of like, we didn't see you in prison. And, and the sick people in our culture, not there, we didn't see you, Jesus, as being sick. And then Jesus says, if you did it to one of those, you were doing it to me. Amen. And so I want to hear all of us have a good report. And I believe we will get a good report. And the good report is Jesus saying to all of us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of my kingdom. And so I want all of us to have a legacy of doing the gospel the right way. Too many Christians around the world and here in the United States are doing the gospel according to the own terms instead of allowing Jesus and his demands of what he says to be the way that we do the gospel. We just answer you.